The thalamus is a cluster of nuclei shaped like an American football. It is a bilateral structure with one in each hemisphere of the brain, and it acts as a relay station controlling the flow of information to the neocortex. The thalamus is composed of many different nuclei, and each consists of thalamic relay neurons. These are excitatory neurons, which receive information from a variety of different brain areas and relay this information to areas of the neocortex. 25% of the cells in the thalamus are local inhibitory interneurons, which act to inhibit the relay neurons. One thalamic nucleus which stands apart from the others is the thalamic reticular nucleus. This is a thin sheet of inhibitory interneurons, which surrounds the other thalamic nuclei. Neurons in the thalamic reticular nucleus do not project to the cortex, but instead send inhibitory connections to the other thalamic nuclei. The inputs to the thalamic nuclei can be split into drivers and modulators. Drivers are the inputs which actually represent the information being transmitted to the cortex. They form large glutamatergic synapses with the relay neurons. However, only about 10% of the synapses to relay cells are drivers. The other 90% are modulators. Modulators are inputs from other brain areas, which form smaller synapses and serve to modify the transmission of the drivers to the neocortex. Modulators can arise from a variety of different brain areas, including inhibitory interneurons within the thalamus, the thalamic reticular nucleus, brainstem regions, and feedback from the cortex. A distinction is made between two functional groups of thalamic nuclei, first order and higher order. The difference between these is where the drivers come from. The drivers for first order nuclei arise from the peripheral nervous system or lower brain centers. First order nuclei therefore relay subcortical information to the neocortex and are particularly important in the early stages of sensory processing. In contrast, the drivers for higher order nuclei arise from the neocortex and higher order nuclei relay information from one area of the cortex to another. For this reason, they are thought to relay information which has been through higher levels of processing. We can now see that the thalamus does not act in isolation, but coordinates with a number of brain areas. The basic thalamocortical circuit is as follows. Subcortical inputs excite the relay cells of first order thalamic nuclei. These send excitatory inputs to layer four of the neocortex. On their way to the cortex, they send excitatory inputs to the inhibitory neurons of the thalamic reticular nucleus. Neurons in the thalamic reticular nucleus, in turn, send inhibitory connections back to thalamic relay cells. Neurons from layer six of the cortex then provide excitatory feedback, both to the thalamic relay neurons and also to neurons in the thalamic reticular nucleus. Neurons from layer five of the cortex are then the drivers of higher order thalamic nuclei. Higher order thalamic nuclei then repeat this same pattern sending excitatory connections to layer four of the cortex and thalamic reticular nucleus, whilst also receiving excitatory feedback from the cortex and inhibitory feedback from the thalamic reticular nucleus. Other modulatory input to the thalamus also comes from a number of brainstem nuclei, which stimulate thalamic nuclei with the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. To fully understand how the system works, we need to understand a special property of thalamic relay neurons. This is their ability to shift between two different modes of firing, tonic and bursting. Tonic firing is the normal mode of firing used by other neurons we've seen. During tonic firing, an input produces a train of action potentials. In contrast, when in bursting mode, thalamic neurons undergo short bursts of high frequency spiking, followed by periods of relative silence with very few spikes. Thalamic neurons are able to fire in bursting mode because they express a special type of calcium channel known as the T-type calcium channel. This channel contains two gates, an activation gate and an inactivation gate. Both need to be open for calcium to flow through the channel. The activation gate is opened rapidly by depolarization and closed rapidly by hyperpolarization, whereas the inactivation gate is the opposite. It is opened by hyperpolarization and closed by depolarization. Crucially, this gate is very slow to open and close taking about 100 milliseconds. To see how this results in bursting, imagine the cell undergoes inhibition and the membrane potential is hyperpolarized for 100 milliseconds. The inactivation gate therefore is open. Now, if a neuron is suddenly depolarized by an input, the activation gate will rapidly open. The inactivation gate will start to close, but will take 100 milliseconds to do so. 
During this time, both gates are open, and so positively charged calcium can rush into the neuron. This continuous flow of positive charge into the neuron triggers a rapid succession of action potentials, until eventually the inactivation gate closes and the neuron stops firing. So we can see that whether a relay neuron will fire in burst or tonic mode depends upon what it has been doing for the previous 100 milliseconds. If it has been inhibited, the inactivation gate will be open, so when the neuron is next depolarized, current will continuously flow through the channel, triggering bursting. In contrast, if the neuron has been depolarized, the inactivation gate will be closed. The neuron will not burst, but fire normally in tonic mode. The other components of the thalamocortical system can act to switch thalamic relay neurons from one mode of firing to another. The thalamic reticular nucleus provides inhibitory input to thalamic relay cells. This hyperpolarizes the thalamic relay neurons and allows the inactivation gate to open. This means that the thalamic relay neurons will now respond with a burst of action potentials when next stimulated. In contrast, the brainstem modulatory inputs release acetylcholine. This depolarizes the thalamic neurons, closing the inactivation gate, and means that the neurons will fire in tonic mode when next stimulated. The effect of cortical feedback is more complicated. When firing at low firing rates, cortical neurons initially excite thalamic relay neurons. However, they also excite the inhibitory neurons in the thalamic reticular nucleus. The inhibition from the thalamic reticular nucleus is much greater than the excitation from the cortex. So the net effect is a brief excitation followed by overall inhibition. However, when cortical neurons fire at high frequencies, they undergo a process known as facilitation. This is where calcium builds up in the neuron over time, causing it to release more and more neurotransmitter with each action potential. This means that at high firing rates, the output from the neuron gets stronger over time. An opposite process happens with the inhibitory thalamic reticular neurons, as over time, they run out of neurotransmitter. This means that at high firing rates, the output from these inhibitory neurons gets weaker. This is known as synaptic depression. The combination of these effects means that at high firing rates, cortical feedback ends up stronger than the inhibition from the reticular nucleus, and so the thalamic relay neurons are depolarized. But what is the purpose of having two modes of firing, and why switch between them? When firing in tonic mode, the firing rate of the neuron changes linearly with the strength of the input, i.e. the stronger the input they are encoding, the greater their firing rate. This means that in tonic mode, the thalamic neurons are able to relay information accurately. However, in bursting mode, this linear relationship is lost, as a stimulus of any strength will elicit a similar burst of firing. However, a rapid burst of action potentials means cortical neurons receive a lot of input in a short space of time. This means that bursts are very effective at stimulating cortical neurons. So although bursts convey the information less accurately, they send a strong message and are effective at activating the cortex. This has led to the wake-up call theory of thalamic function, which is as follows. Initially, a novel stimulus triggers bursting of thalamic neurons. This strongly activates an area of cortex, directing the animal's attention towards the new stimulus and signaling that it is important. The strong activation of cortical cells allows them to feed back with higher frequency to the thalamus and excite thalamic neurons, switching them from burst mode to tonic mode. Tonic mode then allows relay neurons to subsequently convey the information about the new stimulus more accurately, allowing the new stimulus to then be analyzed by the cortex in detail. The brainstem nuclei project more diffusely and are probably involved in globally regulating the balance between tonic and bursting modes, depending on how awake or alert an animal is. In conclusion, the thalamus is a group of nuclei which relay information to the cortex. First order thalamic nuclei relay subcortical messages to the cortex, and higher order thalamic nuclei relay messages from one area of the cortex to another. Each thalamic nucleus relays the information from its drivers, whilst modulators alter the transmission of this information. Thalamic relay neurons are able to fire in two different modes, bursting and tonic, due to the presence of a special calcium channel. They can be switched from one mode to another by input from other brain areas, including cortical feedback, the thalamic reticular nucleus, and brainstem cholinergic inputs. It is thought that bursting is useful for the initial detection of stimuli, and once the cortex has been alerted to the new stimulus, they are switched into tonic mode, which more accurately relays the information for further analysis.